Retro Hangover is supported via Patreon by listeners like you. We'd especially like to thank patrons Lyle McCarns, Ashton Ruby, Randall Quiggle, Tony G, Stud Still Smash the Milkman, Keith Gasper, Raging Demon, Miss Peachy, Mass Keaton, Discimera, Ozzy Garcia, JC, Megan Caruso, Andrew Liguori, Lunchbox, aka the Discredible Gamer, Adam from the Good, the Bad, and the Backlog, Rick Firestone, Dave Jackson, Jenny E, Retro Overdrive, Soha, Parallax Puddles, The Emperor, Storm Beagle, Matt, aka Stormageddon, B Ross and Van Fernal from Super Garbage Day, Gary Heather, The Retro Vixen, Eric Guess, Nomad from the Retro Wildlands Podcast, Ash Events, Alan Bingham, Mike the Rep from Backbreaker Gaming, Ryan Player One, Low Five Alex, Alt, Raider Dreaming, and Oh Me. Your continued engagement and generous donations are deeply appreciated. Welcome to The Flights, a consumable curation of champions and catastrophes that is considerate of your chronometer. It's me, Chris Copeland, and I have a theory. I'm not going to say what you want me to say. It is a fan theory about <laughs> video games. There, I think I got around it. Yes, thank you, know, thank, you know. thank you, Chris Pat. Fuck you. <laughs> and as you can already tell, I am joined by Shane Dick Dragon. Salter, how are you doing today, Shane? Do you have any theories that you would like to share with us before we get into the actual ones? Uh, the uh, L is real. There you go. Is that Death Note? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's fucking Mario 64. <laughs> oh, I think it's Death Note. Uh, this topic was recommended by Keith Gasper of the current and former Main Quest podcast. And if you want to recommend a topic first, join our Patreon for as little as $1 a month and then head over to our Discord, which is free for everybody, but only patrons can make recommendations over in our top five suggestions channel. Put your suggestion in there. We'll put it up on a poll over at Patreon. We'll vote and then we'll talk about it if that's what you all want us to talk about. And thanks again, Keith, for recommending this topic. This seems perfect for you to recommend if I must say so myself, but also, go check out the Main Quest podcast. It's a great show with a fantastic backlog. Friends of the show. He's also a member of COG. So, yeah. Thanks, Keith. And we'll move right on into it. Uh, what do you say there, Shane? Yeah, let's let's do it. Number five. All right. So, I'm going to kick things off. Uh, by the way, well, with a disclaimer, I suppose, in that I found out that, at least for me, uh, wildest fan theory seemed to translate to darkest. So just keep, keep that in mind for the rest of my list. Um, all right. Indeed. So uh, my number five is from Star Fox. And that is the theory uh, that goes that all Star Fox pilots are required to amputate their legs. So art for the game would uh, seem to show that all of the pilots have metal legs, which sort of gives rise to this speculation that they've all undergone some sort of surgery, um, perhaps to better survive intense G-forces of flying in space. I don't know. But if it was true, I mean, they were probably kind of pissed when G-diffusers were introduced on their R-wings in Star Fox 64. <laughs> Because I guess they lost their legs for nothing. Um, but, you know, uh, one Star Fox programmer, uh, Dylan Cuthbert, has claimed that the creators of the original models uh, basically just couldn't be fucked to model feet. And that's why they got mechanical legs and such. Uh, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that. I don't know if it tracks. I think it's some sort of really strange requirements of, of, of Star Fox that you uh, you gotta get them gotta get them bitches chopped off before you can fly. I think that's the prime definition. 
in this case with the GD fusers that some have to crawl before others can walk. <laughs> that yes, that is weirdly accurate. Yes. Hooray. My number five is that Peakman takes place on a post-apocalyptic Earth. Mm. And I haven't seen any confirmation about it on it. I don't know if it has been confirmed, but it's right up there with Kirby 64 with the Ice Planet saying that that's like Earth in the future and that everyone's dead. And I think Miyamoto has come out and said that the planet that they're on, which is like PN404, PF404, something like that, is a planet where humans were on but are now extinct which kind of infers that that would be Earth. But I don't think anything has definitively been said. Maybe it has. Maybe it has. I'm, I'm kind of out of the loop on Peakman lore. I apologize. But I think that's really cool when you consider that you're trying to get your spaceship built back up and it's just you're collecting things from a world where, you know, that we have fucked over, which feels, I don't know, appropriate... And we just and you're collecting the the pieces to build your spaceship from like dead us, like we just left behind when we all died. That's her getting off the planet. So that's that's kind of that's kind of cool. That's pretty wild. Peakman, a nice happy family game. You're playing with your family, where you're in a world where you and your family died due to a uh, apocalyptic climate thing, or maybe a meteor. One of the two. Everyone's dead. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> So there you go, Peekman. Oh, I guess glad to know that I'm not the only one that has a, a dark list of theories. Number four. All right, number four. Pokemon Red and Blue. And the theory is, you straight up fucking murdered Gary's Raticate. <laughs> yep. Uh, so Pokemon... I guess never die. They only faint, right? In in combat. Um, of course, until you make your way over to Pokemon Tower in Lavender Town and you realize that, oh God, they they do die. Shit. Um, Gary, your your rival throughout the game, is spotted in the tower, uh, mourning something or someone, but we aren't really told like which Pokemon he's there for. Um, but if you really start to put the pieces together, you probably may remember that towards the beginning of the game, Gary had his his trusty old Rattata, um, which, of course, eventually evolves into Raticate. Um, He uses it when you battle him on the SS Anne, but you never see the Raticate again after that point. So the implication is that you, you done homicided this poor man's rat um, because I guess you really wanted to drive home the fact that you're better than him. I don't know. Um, but, but there you go. Pokemon murder is my number four. Blame Pikachu. That's he doesn't get enough shit. Bet. Yeah. My number four is from Portal. God damn it. Which is the companion cube has a person in it. <laughs> uh, so I take it you had that too? I do. Yes. Okay. Okay. So uh, we'll probably talk more about that when it comes to Shane, but well, I think the, honestly, the theory. I say hon- honestly, we we can we can just we can just chat about it now because it's my number three. So there you go. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. that works out. So yeah, I mean, it's heavily implied when Glado says that there's a person. It doesn't it scream when you throw it in a fire? Uh, I think. Or is that just my imagination? Maybe I can't actually recall if that happens or not. But I mean, the the other sort of things that people kind of point to, right? To lends some credibility to this theory is that some of the like the oddly specific things that GLaDOS says to you about the com- companion cube like it will never stab you or basically it can't talk but if it does talk to you just ignore it essentially yeah um yep. yeah so the the weight in the companion cube is in fact the the bodies of previous failed test subjects and i I think somebody actually i think it was i think it was game theory that actually took the the like the rough measurements of a companion cube and found out that it's very possible to fit not only one but multiple corpses inside of it so there you go i mean who's to say they're even corpses because it's suggested that they could talk to you yeah i mean might be alive they could be yeah maybe why not both 
That whole game is very dark. <laughs> yeah. I love Portal. It's so good. Anyway, yeah, that's that's the theory. And you said number three. Do I just need to go into my number three then? I guess so. Yeah, I just fucking roll right into it. Let's go. I mean, this is going to be a quick one. Number three. My number three is that in Mass Effect 3, that the reason everything at the end is all screwed up and nothing makes sense and the ending is so unsatisfying is because in reality, Shepard has been indoctrinated by the Reavers. Hmm. The Reapers. The Reapers. Um, it's been so long since I've played the game, getting into the intricate plot details about why this became a fan theory makes sense. But needless to say, there are plenty of YouTube videos out there that really make sense of it. Some of the decisions that Shepard ends up making, some of the changes in the world that end up happening, the whole entire like final running rush scene at the end of Mass Effect 3 when you're on the battlefield and things just get weird. And it's there's there's just things at the end of Mass Effect 3 that heavily could implicate if you want to go in this direction. This is why it's a wild fan theory that instead of Shepard ending up saving the entire human race, he is indoctrinated by the Reapers and he's essentially in a fever dream and the choice is just him wrestling with his inner demons. The, the three choices about whether or not he's going to be all human, there's a Reaper hybrid, or the Reapers just take over. And... The, the, yeah, I mean, that's that was is it's really came out of a massive cope for how badly people received the ending, which, if you care for my opinion, I do not think it was as horrible as people made it out to be. I do like the changes they made, but I don't think it was really all that necessary. But yeah, this fan theory came out of the cope of that of that ending and tried to justify it in a way that made Shepard look like the Reapers had actually already won and you were on that voyage. And again, I think that fan theory is very well crafted. It has, I think, generally been disproven and is not canon. But I, I actually think that probably would have been much more interesting and satisfying. But again, I think it still would have gone against the object of what Mass Effect initially said that they were set out to do. Alrighty. If that makes sense. Yeah. Well, yeah. we're going to bump right over to uh my number two i guess this 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 will be fun to edit later number two uh all right so my number two uh <laughs> is uh pac-man of all things and that is really that pac-man is in fact haunted by his past mistakes so uh the way that this theory goes is that the four ghosts that uh, chase him around are, in fact, representations of some major life choices or things that he did wrong in his past that are continuing to haunt him that he is running away from. And the little pellets that he is eating are basically like medicines uh, or like antipsychotics or something like that, um, which may explain why he turns invincible to all of his air quotes problems for a while. Um, it won't last forever, but, uh, you know, it, it, it sort of protects him, if you will, from having to deal with those things. Um, and then if, you know, if any of those ghosts touch him, then he dies, um, which one might you know, infer could be representative of maybe a drug overdose or maybe he took a trip down the sewer slide. So, I mean, there you go. I bet you never thought about that in that way with Pac-Man, but I've probably ruined that one for you now too. So you're welcome. What's the sewer slide? It's a way to say suicide without getting like struck from different media platforms. <laughs> Why is that being struck? It's a word. It's anyway, I'm not going to get into the. Yeah, it's a, it's a whole the word. it's a whole thing. Yeah. yeah, that's so Jesus. Anyway. All right. My number two is something that was popularized by game theory, I believe. And that is in Majora's Mask. Link is dead. Yes. I almost put this one on my list. 
I think this one is is great because the language around it, at least in the English translation, the one that we got, very much could suggest that this is a possibility that when he goes down into Termina Town, because Termina Town is just it's like outside Hyrule. It doesn't exist in that world. There's no reason for this place to be what it is. It's just so outside of the norm of even what the world of Zelda is, which includes a lot of fantasy elements. For the moon to have a giant face and be pressing down on the world, which is separate from another world, it's just, it's surreal. And I don't, I don't think they excuse it at the end of the game as just being some dream. And the fact that when you fall down there, they say, I see you have suffered a terrible fate, which is very comparable to, I think, other media where they say that to indicate that someone has died mm-hmm. or is about to die. And there's if like game theory does a very good job with this. It's one of the videos that really broke a game theory open where they, you know, Matt Pat does explain how Link is going through the seven stages of grief and each new level that you're going through gets you through those those processes of, you know, th- those stages. I don't know the formal name of it, but um, or even the steps, but it's just those stages of grief, so the seven stages of grief, mm-hmm. and they're all representative of that. And man, would it be cool if that was the case. And even with the timeline that came out where it says one of them that Link is dead, it just kind of put more fuel into the fire where like Link doesn't succeed in defeating Ganon, causing this timeline to happen. Which, by the way, the Zelda timeline in and of itself is completely stupid. I don't know why it exists. <laughs> it, I think because, it's dumb. Yeah, I, I honestly think it's just because Nintendo caved to like decades of fans being like, how do any of these things go together? And they're like, fucking, we never bothered to care about that. But I guess let's fucking retcon a bunch of shit to make it make sense. And it it still doesn't. Yeah. It still doesn't. <laughs> Yeah, so, I mean, they do that, and then they say, no, Link isn't really dead, but they have a path where Link is dead, and I don't, I don't know. Well, I mean... Uh, I think it's a cool theory. I, I think it really is. It's wild, but, and I love it, and I wish that was the case, but of course it's not, but yeah, I, lo- I do love the fan theory. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, well, and the fact that it's Termina Town, which basically just means the end, Yes. right? Yes! Um. Yeah, no, it's, it, it is a good one, definitely. And like when Link puts on that ultimate mask and the, like the God mask, he looks like a corpse. Mm-hmm. Or just the fact it's, that you're putting on basically the faces of other creatures. <laughs> yes. And they're saying that the masks that you're wearing are the masks of dead people mm-hmm. are the masks of the dead creatures you're putting on. They all die and you're wearing their death masks. It's it makes sense. <laughs> you can't. <laughs> oh, man, I love it. Oh, it's like so creepy. It makes that game better if it's true. I love it. Anyway, go ahead, Shane. You're number one. Number one. All right. Well, uh, th- this also happens to be one that I think holds a lot of a lot of water. Potentially, no pun intended. But um, too much water. No, well, it depends on, well, it depends on which ending you get. Uh, No, so my number one is Silent Hill 2 in that the theory goes, uh, Mary's body was in the trunk of your car the entire time. Ooh, I almost put that on my list. Yeah, Um, I I really like this one. Um, So there's, there are a number of things that kind of point to this being potentially valid, right? Um, So there are multiple endings to Silent Hill 2, just like the other ones. Um, In the the water ending, James ends up driving his car off of a cliff saying that now, quote, they can be together, which could just mean like together in death. But in the rebirth ending, James makes these plans to try to revive Mary basically revive her corpse, which some people interpret to mean that Mary is, has to be close by somewhere if that's his plan to do this. And why not in the trunk of his car? And I think it makes a lot of sense given like how the story of the game goes and what you end up finding out and like the reason that he went back to Silent Hill in the first place. Um I don't know. To me, it's, I don't, this has never been officially confirmed, hence it's still a fan theory, but like, to me, I kind of, this sort of is just part of my headcanon, I think, for Silent Hill 2, just because I like how well it fits with the rest of the narrative. I, I do think it makes sense. I, 
I, I think one of the things about the developers of that game is they've they've kind of let people go wild with these theories, which I appreciate. They haven't really mm -hmm. confirmed or denied any of them. And I love it when a developer does that. They're kind of like, well, what do you think? <laughs> like, well, I think this. I'm like, mm, maybe you might be right. Maybe you might be wrong. Yeah, it's like, like well, you know. pretty cool. Yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, like, you know, is that true? I don't know. Do you want it to be? God damn it! <laughs> uh, but I like that. I actually do. I, I appreciate that. Uh, which kind of goes into my number one. And the developers did shoot this one down, so this is definitely a theory, and it's not real. But I wish they wouldn't, because it would make the game a hell of a lot better and make a ton more sense. And my number one is that in Final Fantasy VIII, at the end of disc one, mm. Squall dies. And why wouldn't he? You get up to the, the um, what's her name? The sorceress, Idea, and she takes this giant icicle, ice pick, ice spell, whatever you want to call it, and puts it right through the middle of dude's chest. It goes all the way through. It's a cutscene happening. You see this thing go through his body, like Sephiroth's sword, stabby, stabby Aerith, and it goes through her body. And he falls off a platform with Renoa reaching to him. And then the very next scene at the beginning of disc two, Squall wakes up and he's like, oh, how did I get here? Where's my wound? I don't have a wound anymore. There's there's no evidence of it. What? <laughs> what? Are you, like, are, okay. Like, let's just throw... Even the game recognizes that, like, something's weird. Not to mention the entire tone and tenor of the game just completely shifts. It just, like, if you look, look at the theory, and I'm talking about this because, like, I've looked at the theory and I've applied it to the game, and it's 100%, like, it's true. The writing style changes. The The tone of the game changes. In the, in the first disc, Squall was, like, he was the leader, but it wasn't just assumed that he would be the leader. He was just one of the bunch. Uh, Renoa doesn't even care about him, doesn't like him. She's more obsessed with Seifer. And then it gets into disc two, and all of a sudden, Renoa's just head over heels in love with Squall, and everyone's trying to hook them up. And everyone just try, just pretty much puts all of their previous uh, proclivities and throws them to the side and just surrenders it up to Squall. Like Squall is the lead protagonist and everything is about him all of a sudden and everyone is gravitating towards him. And there's this giant octopus monster that's the uh, benefactor of your garden that is only mentioned there and there only and just all goes away and is part of a race that hadn't existed up until this point. And then you have like, those little cat-like creatures that I can't remember the name of just coming out, which were not really part of the game anywhere up until that point prior to, which I get it. It's a Final Fantasy game. Things like that can happen. But, like, just just everything, like the whole entire orphanage scene, that all of a sudden everyone is conveniently from the same orphanage, that memed to death plot points or that joked about plot point, or the fact that you're going to fucking outer space and finding hidden cities and... All this stuff. It just, it's weird. It's weird. And then you get to the ending and the ending itself, like some of the final movies that Squall isn't in the ending movie. Um, When like everyone comes out of it. And then there's that really freaky photo where Squall's face is like, there's a hole in it and everything like that. And I know I'm really rambling at this point. You should really go check out this theory because I love the theory. It makes sense. And it would excuse a lot of the flaws, the very, very, very deep flaws with Final Fantasy VIII's plot, because it is horrible if you take it on its face. But if you take it as a like a death throw, a final dream that Squall is having while he is dying, it covers up for a lot of those flaws and makes things make a lot more sense because it is so stupid that there's no way for the plot to make sense otherwise. So I want it to be true. So my number one is Final Fantasy VIII Squall's Dead. I'm pretty sure, by the way, that this one, uh, I'm, the other ones might have it, but I'm not aware. This theory is so prevalent, by the way, that there's, there's, just, there's a website dedicated to it, just squallsdead.com. <laughs> really? I did not know that. Yeah, yeah. 
I, so I don't even know if it's wild. It's just like, please, please make this real <laughs> so this game, so this game can be excused. I say for, it, for it also sounds like more crap. cope, honestly. <laughs> it definitely is more. No, it, yeah, it is cope. It's definitely cope because I think many fans who want to believe this also have the same mentality I do, which is I don't want this game. I like that the plot can't be this bad. It can't be this bad. It can't be this stupid. So, and yeah, the creators came out and um, I think it was Katase who said, no, 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 Squall's not dead. That's stupid. Like, no, actually, uh, something else is stupid. <laughs> uh, uh. <laughs> All right. Well, there you go. Our, our top five wild fan theories. Um, s- some maybe not as wild as others, maybe the ones that we kind of just want to be real. Um, but you know, there's, there's a lot of other ones out there, but of course I, I tried to pick ones that, you know, were, were close to me, um, for the most part, mostly because I wouldn't be able to talk intelligently about any of the other ones. Um, but there you go. So, uh, yeah, we got stuff. I don't know if you know this. But we do. If you do. if you've listened to the show before, then you may know that uh, we we got you know we got some things happening. Uh, they're they're available if you'd like to to see them to check them out. Um, apart from this this main feed of the show here that you happen to be listening to, we uh, we've got some other stuff. We've got a a whole bunch of bonus content, which is available on our Patreon, so if you'd like to become a patron for as little as $1 a month, then you too can get in on all of that extra stuff that you have been missing out on for literally years. There's there's just, there's so much. Um, one may argue that you could fill your entire entertainment quota with, with just us. Um, I wouldn't recommend it but you could do it. So uh, head on over to our, our Patreon if you want to check that out. We have our merch store as well, um, as well as, uh, you know, all the usuals, the the social medias, you know, the, the YouTube channel. We got a Twitch stream thing happening on the reg. And all this stuff is at our link tree. So go on over to linktr.ee dot ee slash retro hangover. And, uh, you know, t- just t- tippy tap on the thing that you want to go to. And then the magical nightmare rectangle in your hand will take you to a place that is arguably more enjoyable than probably like 80% of whatever else is going on in the world. So there you go. We're through somehow dark fan theories. We are bringing light into your life. So you're welcome. Yeah. I like how Chris has no idea how to like go from there. <laughs> All right. Let no. me segue this thing like fucking <laughs> Paul Blart, the Mara Mall Cop. Uh, Chris. I got you, it. What, what, you, what you telling people about streams? What happened <laughs> on the Sundays? Uh, I feel like I missed a giant opportunity here. But uh, you head over to twitch.tv slash retro hangover. We'll, we'll get darker. We'll get grittier. Mm. We'll get edgier. We'll we'll be we'll be your dark siders if you want us to be so cringe on top of it. Uh, we probably won't be playing dark siders unless we are. We might someday. I'm not saying we will, but yeah, head over to twitch.tv slash retro hangover at 9 p.m. Eastern time on Sundays and you'll find something over there. I promise. Maybe. But yeah, see you then. All right. There you have it. Well. I suppose, now with all those theories out of the way, until next time. Play with your Squall is Totally Alive joysticks.